Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tech Talk Travel. Uh, we're really thrilled and excited to be uh, at EHL here in Lucerne today in, in Switzerland. And joining us today is Ines Blal, who is the Managing Director and Executive Dean of the college and the campus here. Ines, thank you so much for, for being here today. Oh, actually, thank you for having us today. Oh, welcome. Um, welcome to and, and for accompanying us. We're really excited to be here. It's great to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I'd like to start by asking you, now that you've experienced this crisis and you've come out of it on the other side, what lessons did you learn as a, a leader about how to adjust to radical change? And what have you put in place to better prepare for the next crisis, whenever that might be? Um, yeah, so as you were saying, first of all, we are not of the, out, out of the wood yet. We're definitely not there. But, uh, but I think a light at the end of the tunnel is there. But for sure, this crisis, very hard, pressing time is over. I mean, it, I feel it and I feel it with the teams. Um, now, how did we adjust? So much happened to any higher ed education and on the top of that, in hospitality. So we, we had this double pressure. But... Um, Overall, I think we adjusted well, given the circumstances. We really, uh, we, we really managed well. And, and if I were now looking back at what make it really that successful, I would say two main ingredients is the expertise of the people in my staff, be it the faculty, but also the administration, the expertise of each one of them. And the second thing is the values, the EHL community values. I mean, yes, we have these values. They're not even written on the walls, but uh, of innovation, of learning, of excellence. And these were tested and they really came true. And I think that was also one of the learning as a leader that no matter what, <laughs> I think it was, um, what, what's his name? It was Peter Drucker that used to say that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, I lived it during the, the crisis. Yeah. Um, so obviously during the crisis, you also need a certain type of leadership uh, of executive decisions made daily, sometimes hourly. But it's not possible if the team does not come up with pre-done analysis of what are the situation, uh, expert-based and evidence-based recommendations. Uh, you can be all the leader you want if you don't have that. Uh, and if they don't give you that visibility with the advantage, disadvantage, the risk you are taking, and then they said, okay, now it's up to you to say which risk we're gonna take. Mm. And, um, and so, yeah, I would say really this expertise, uh, I was very lucky, I am very lucky to have it at EHL, again, faculty. Um, because it's a crisis where everyone, especially during the lockdown, everyone was alone at home. Mm. And, and so it was very, very important to let them feel that even if they were alone physically, they were connected to that community, be it a student and faculty. And thankfully, these EHL values, that's when um, they came very, very handy. Mm. I say more than handy, very helpful. So for the future, we're going to build on that, uh, that's from the management side. We're going to build on that, be, it, be very clear on the expertise, on who does what, and, and also give leeway, I already had that before, but now it's even more important, to give leeway for decision um, at every level of the team, and also decision at team level. Um, keep the experts, keep the spirit of always improving, uh, always finding solution. And our obsession was the student journey. So now for my second mandate, I just articulated clearly that we're going to shift even more everything about the learner. Everything we have to do is about the learner. And speaking about the learner during the crisis, well, they have been shaken up. <laughs> Imagine your university time stuck at home. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. the luckiest were with their roommates. <laughs> yeah. um, and having sometimes six hours in front of the screen, mm. and they managed to do it. And again, thanks to that community spirit, they were creative in creating support group, and also sometimes sending messages to thank us, mm. saying we hate it, especially the first weeks were not really a great learning experience in terms of um, education. And then we obviously all learned together. But uh, yeah, it was nice at the end of a very long day to get a message from a student saying, thank you. Mm. I mean, it's hard for everyone, but, but thank you. 
And, and that I obviously that's one one of, of crisis management. We learn that in every MBA, but communication is key. Um, during the lockdown, I used to write a long email uh, to all my staff and, and teams and faculty to tell them what, what we did collectively, actually what they did. And I, I had the privilege to see it overall, but just to list them what collectively they did every week to go through the crisis. And, and I think that that was important. And obviously, I realized that um, crisis is good in management <laughs> because I had this agenda of digitalization that we kicked in at the group level because before I stepped in in 2017. And when I stepped in, I had to execute the blended MBA. And obviously, I had an agenda of digitalization. And the COVID, in that sense, was a godsend because, yeah, I will do digitalization. Yeah, it's in the book. It kind of forced the issue of it, right? Exactly. Yeah. We had some classes. We started in the preparatory year. But now everybody is like, how do I digitalize? And, and that was just to mobilize and, and accelerate. Uh, the example I always give is the online exams. It was due for a pilot for February 20 or September 20. And because of the COVID, we had six weeks, and we launched it in June 20. So, sorry, it was due September 21, wow. and we launched it. Wow, June 20. <laughs> yes, yeah. we had six weeks instead of 18 months. Right, right. And because we had experts, because we had good values, uh, in the sense, cohesive values and this yeah. um, EHL community spirit, mm. we made it. Right. Um, so uh, that, that was really a concrete example. If I didn't have the expertise in the faculty, in the teams, in the digital team, uh, coming together saying, if you do that, these are the risks, if you do that, and so we could decide together, it would have not been possible. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. communicate about it. Um, yeah. um, uh, it wouldn't have been possible. So we're going to keep that. And the main, main thing, but I think that's in any podcast about higher ed or article you hear or any conference you go in higher education, is how the job of teaching has changed. Mm. And I say has changed because I don't think we will ever, I mean, we'll come back to being in the classroom, but we learn so much about how technology can help us better learn and teach that there is no coming back from that. Yeah. And, and, and I'm saying it in a very positive way. So at EHL, that's the main thing we're going for. The learner, the learner journey, um, using all technology available. Um, I'm sure you know all the ed tech has mm -hmm. boomed uh, during the crisis. And I think that's a momentum we will definitely uh, capitalize on at EHL. Yeah, and I think you make a very good point because I think those that really will thrive moving forward are the ones that embrace the yeah. crisis and embrace the change and digitization not only on the educational side but even operationally and we'll touch on that a little bit further in our conversation but hotels are finding themselves also in a very similar situation how how are they going to adjust on this and um, I, I think yeah the, the fact that you've embraced that is is I think a, a very commendable and and the right approach for sure 100 percent yeah, well, that's what I talk about. Sorry, to come back to the culture because it's so strong, it's really hard to communicate. But one of the messages I sent, I, I say to the team when the first time I saw them in presence was not doing it was never on the table. Right. It was, it didn't even cross, No, nobody thought about it. It's like, okay, now what do we do and how can I help? Mm -hmm. Nobody even thought about, okay, let's chill and see what happens. It was, it was just, and that was incredible for a manager to yeah. say, yeah. Okay, now yeah. we need to mobilize. Yeah. And, and yeah. so. Which actually comes to my next question, because we, we, what I wanted to ask you as well is, what was, when this whole thing started and moving forward for the initial months as, as you were working through that transition, I'm sure there were many, but what were some of the key messages that you were giving to your, your, your staff, but also to the students? Because you mentioned earlier, they themselves found themselves in, in an environment where they're off campus, they're looking at a computer screen for six hours a day. Motivation probably is yeah. affected from that. Yeah. So how do you keep motivation at the, the, the level it needs to be? And, and how did you approach that aspect? It's of a whole it? community. There are also sometimes the sponsors, the parents, they call you and they are stressed and everybody is stressed and the uncertainty of it. One thing I, I kept on saying in every weekly communication and when I spoke to students through videos, or we are in it together. I mean, it was a crisis where also the social aspect, I mean, the other became a menace. Yeah. Psychologically, it's, it's important, and, and at EHL, we value very much the, 
the interaction, the human interaction, the talent, and, and, and that was threatened. So what I kept on saying is we are in it together. EHL is strong. We are strong. We are being tested. We will make it together. And, and I mean, we saw, we have one of the things, for example, a forum was created by faculty to exchange on tips. Hey, I'm putting the mic this way and putting this camera this way. And it worked really well. And, and, and the students also. And so we're using technologies to be even more EHL. Uh, and the second message, and that was more to the students, but sometimes on one-to-one -to, -one to faculty, is uncertainty is okay. I mean, it's not like it's good or bad. But change is a norm, mm. and and change can it's it's life. Yeah. So yeah. so as you were saying, embrace it, uh, and it's okay that we don't know uh, what will be our next travel uh, trip. It's okay, mm. um, and 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 it's good in a growth mindset. So that, these were my two messages during the crisis. Right. Although myself, sometimes there are some days where like, <laughs> yes. but, but I think yeah. that's being human, isn't it? You always exactly. question sometimes yourself. <laughs> yeah. But these were the two messages. We are not alone. We are a community, um, and everyone is alone but struggling, and and uncertainty is life. Mm. Change is the norm. Thinking that things will be remain stable is an illusion. Um, so. Mm. That's life. Yeah, very good. Okay, so in, in terms of the biggest challenges for educational institutions throughout a COVID world now that we're living in, where do you see the biggest challenges that not just yourself, but almost any educational insti institution needs to navigate? For example, virtual learning sessions, it's a way of managing the process, but how does it impact the student and their experience of being a student overall? Yeah. Because when we were students, we had that luxury of being with students and having a student life. That's now changed. Um, and, and how are, are you at EHL specifically trying to bridge that gap so that the students feel like they, they still have that opportunity? So the student experience, I think that it will come back. I think this, this is part of human life. I mean, when we were 20s, I mean, we're not going to spoil a lot of secrets. I don't know you, but we used to party and go out. Yep. And that was part of the student life. So I think they still do it. They are just limited in, in how they can do it. Um, what we, for us, what is very important is that whenever possible, given the pandemic, is that everyone is back on campus. Maybe through rotation from week to week or day to day, depending on the semester but it's very important keeping the safety measures within all that and and we have been running the school with limited semesters and and managing mitigating the risk of the pandemic so uh, within those constraints ask them at least to be on campus uh, to to respect some security hygiene I mean pandemic mm. security mm. rules and um, but we they deployed so many things so many competences online we have I don't know if you're familiar with the young hotelier summit yes I am yeah. it's, it's a product of EHL mm -hmm. they did an amazing job um, they were scattered all around the world, all across the world. They did it online. Um, so, you know, they're creating new things. They have, we are being more creative in using, uh, we use a lot, um, sorry for the advertising, Teams Microsoft internally. Mm -hmm. So we're using more, most of these channels with the student council. The student body at EHL is very involved and, 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 and they have with management, with the decision making. So they have their forum, their chat for the class reps to also move up their, their, the information. So the crisis has showed us some shortcuts to better communicate on the key elements. And um, but I'm diverging from your question. No, it's fine. It's um, totally fine. Uh, sorry. So I come back to the student experience. This will not change. I mean, we are human beings. We are social animals. We will try to create. At EHL, we insist that the experience should be on site. So we're hopeful in a few weeks to be open in what we call the high flex model, hybrid flexible, where basically half of the classroom is in students is in the class and half is outside and they rotate and the faculty is there. But the whole committees, they can come back. Okay. And obviously for us, the challenge is to completely always drill them on the safety uh, uh, measures. Um, the rest for the future, I think technology also has made a big boom mm. uh, thanks to COVID. Uh, we will see 
a lot of new tools to to follow up on, on that famous learner journey. Yeah. Individualized. I mean, I don't see why some consumer companies are now able to know exactly what we consumed and when and do algorithm on our preferences. I don't I do not see why it won't go to human development. Yeah. I, I consider myself in being the business of human development. Um, so I think we will see many, many things in, in that. Uh, and, and at EHL that we're doing, we are reviewing completely how we're assessing. We're going to start with that. We are digitalizing part of our bachelor curriculum. It's very, actually, we had a long debate on what is digitalizing. <laughs> so we agreed with the academic board that, and the faculty is that out of the 15 weeks of a course, we're going to take one that would be what we call asynchronous, so completely self-paced by a student. Mm -hmm. And I think this right mix, and that, that's the balance we are working on. Have you started that, that process? Yes. Okay. We have started last semester, but it, didn't, it wasn't really a good, I mean, the most exact pilot because we were online still. Right. Right. But we are hoping in September in a few weeks to be back and, and, and starting that. Mm -hmm. So it's really new in higher ed to say, listen, I'm, next Tuesday I'm not going to see you, mm -hmm. but you're still going to study mm -hmm. and you're going to still self-evaluate yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's a great time to be where I am today in, in education because this old-fashioned um, industrial revolution education it's a thing of the past. Maybe I'm too optimistic and try. <laughs> no, but, I, but, I um, like your optimism. Yeah. If I'm honest, I think it's very, it's good because uh, I, I personally feel as well. A lot of educational institutions are a little bit perhaps behind in terms of ha how they're delivering the curriculum yeah. and even what they're delivering. Exactly. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. So, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very hard challenge because it's a fine balance between what the industry wants because our mission is to give the best talent to the industry. Yeah. Um, so what the industry or, you know, there's a difference between what they want and what they need, like, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and, and what the student wants, what the faculty wants and, and thinks it's good and, and, and everybody is right. Yeah. And, and so we have to come to that, uh, to that mix. But what I always say is that this technology or COVID is challenging the core of the business. The question we're asking ourselves is, how do I keep a student motivated? Yes. And this has nothing to do you know, face to face, or if we learn that on digital, that is harder on us, I think it's going to do wonders mm. um, when we bring all this with mm. physical presence. From the pilot that you did with the self-assessment and the self-process for, yeah. for the students, how did you, were you surprised by any of the results or did you feel that they were pretty, pretty much as you expected? Uh, no, it was demanded by students, you know, they really want to do to know, uh, I'm exaggerating, but by the second, how they are doing, how well they are doing based on, this, on the faculty expectations. Mm -hmm. So this is a big challenge we are working on. Um, no, we were surprised with this new generation, you know, they said, oh, it's native and, and actually how much guidance they needed. We underestimated, we said, oh, they are natives. but. Actually, what I realize personally is that they are native users. Yep. And as a mother of small children, but they don't know how the machine functions. So once yeah. the machine is not working or you know, you cannot do this or do that. So we are working a lot. We're introducing the curriculum computational thinking for problem solving. We think that the key skill to give to manager and a human being is okay, there is a problem solving. How a methodology for problem yeah. solving. So yeah. we introduced in semester two, if I'm not three, three um, computational thinking. They don't code, maybe at the end of the semester, but we teach them that engineering thinking of, I have a problem, how do I put it? And how do I solve it? And if it's bugging, how do I debug it? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we think, at least for, especially for this generation, even more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I recently read an article where you were um, commenting on that you wanted to offer students more opportunity to strengthen their skills and problem solving in management as, as well as their core competencies. Um, contactless check-ins, mobile payments, uh, keyless entry systems are becoming the norm within the hospitality industry, as well as pushing you know, digitization solutions further. Now, you also say that customers are ready for new concepts. 
I was curious when you said that because you're you're kind of making it now the statement from the hotel side, telling the hotels, guys, your customers need and want this. We're giving you, we're we're, we're teaching the students this. So, come on, keep up, change. Which, honestly speaking, is is a bit of a shift in the paradigm, given that um, ho the the hotel schools traditionally have been very traditional in their methods of insti of, of institution and education. So can you give us some examples of what your vision for this is moving forward? Where do you, like, how do you see the big picture of this? Uh, first, um, I'm convinced that I'm, I'm a strategy professor from another life, but I, I love my job because I'm executing that. Um, the the and, and um, the hospitality customer has changed. Not all of them. Obviously, there are different segments. We cannot, you know, in hospitality is such a big thing. And and last week, I think I was talking to an alumni, uh, an alumni who started his own company in kitchen designing, and he was telling me. Everything is possible. You know what? Everything is possible. The client is ready for everything. The banker is ready for everything because hey <laughs> cannot be that worse that bad I mean cannot be worse than what we have so again this uncertainty opened uh, opportunities so you have from that context and I think those who have the most entrepreneurial spirit in our students in our alumni in the industry because we think about the industry like this old-fashioned but again you have everything you have the whole spectrum in this industry you have people that are innovating daily and disrupting you have others and I think each one. so you you have uh, all these uh, different um, elements digitalization is hitting it's like higher education it's not about technology it's about our job Mm. It's not about, you know, yes, yeah, there is, there is the tool to do the check-in, but it's about welcoming the guest and the decision a hotelier makes about how to welcome the guest. And I think some hotels should not go for mobile check-in because of their business model, because of their concept and the value proposition. So, so I think, I hope, I really hope for the industry so that we stop copying each other. That would be my hope on the industry is, oh, they did that, they did a spa, I should do a spa. There is a value proposition, a unique one that you're proposing. And I think we were also limited by, by the context. I was talking about the bankers. They were doing their job and being risk averse. But now all odds are off. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, you're bringing a new concept, uh, you know, interest rates are low, at least in, in some parts of the world. Okay, let's go. Or you, you have some private investors in some countries who have some cash, believe it or no, and, and, they, and they follow and the hype is about uh, entrepreneurship and, and we are benefiting from that with the, with the innovation village we are creating with a lot of startups. So in time of change from a strategy theory perspective, in time of change is opportunity. Um, yeah. and, and that's where we are. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, at least people with entrepreneurial spirit, are seeing it, being in education and hospitality. And what I was saying about the customer is that the customer is ready for new things, for many, many things, the CSR, the people, the connectivity. Uh, we are all hungry for traveling, but, but maybe different, maybe not. Uh, and so this for people who provide concepts and experience, I think, if we again have the entrepreneurial spirit, is something, yeah. is something interesting. So that's what I meant by that comment okay. there, um, is that it's opening new doors that we didn't know, and I think it can be interesting. And and while we're EHL and back to the students and the core competencies, you are talking about hotel schools are being traditional, and and we have up kept some of these values. Um, but one thing um, that is essential that we bring from hospitality to the business school, because we are also this special business school, is customer centricity. We are obsessed about the other, the other needs, and the customer experience. And so if we are, you know, our antennae are open and wired that way, and then we give them um, business tools, and reading the context, I think our students, will start to know 
yeah. what to do next in their life. Yeah, very yes. good. And, and staying on with the students, um, again, you know, through the pandemic, we've witnessed, we've all, almost seen an acceleration in certain changes within the industry in many ways, especially around technology. Mm. Um, this potentially creates unprecedented opportunities um, as well around the technology side. So what would you say to people asking about, so if, a, if someone came to you now asking about a career in, in the industry, um, why would, how would you, or what would you say to them, why should people pursue a career in the industry now, given that A, recovery is so slow, and B, that a lot of positions uh, moving forward may also be, um, in many ways, removed because of technology. Yes. Yes. So what would be some of your counters to someone asking you about a career in the industry? I think for personally, and it's, well, obviously I'm biased, and, and it's the time now. It's now the time. Uh, so graduate, our graduates are uh, having difficulties because they are in this adjustment time and they prepared for a world. Uh, and but but I see some of them, most of them, getting interesting positions and jobs and and finding their way through it. And I think it's now because our industry is one of the oldest. Uh, and it has been through wars, uh, other pandemics, <laughs> uh, maybe not global because of our, of our but the global wars, and, and, and it recovered and reinvented itself. Um, and now it's the opportunity to be young in this industry because when I worked in the industry back in the days, there was always this sentence, this is how we always used to do it. And this I hear it less and less, even from top management, from manager, uh, from old, um, old school. And, and there is a renovation in the uh, workforce in hospitality. Again, if you like stable things and maybe I'm very entrepreneurial and very optimistic, so I think that would be fun. Um, for those who are, who are looking for more, more stable, there are still a lot of business transactions. So the whole, we have a lot of graduates working now in banking as usual. There are a lot of hotel transactions being done because, you know, uh, transactions are still happening. Um, uh, yes, it's slowing down and recovering in certain regions, but we witnessed it every semester we had to find, five, to find almost 500 internships for our students and we managed to do it. So if you take the globe, there are pockets where hospitality is working. Mm. Um, so, but for sure, you have to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for an easy going, you know, uh, I'm going to do this and then next year do that. But frankly, I don't think today any career, maybe medicine, <laughs> maybe academia, um, but any other career where you could say, okay, I'm just going to cruise or... Mm. No. So, yeah. yes. Of all of the graduates that you have, I mean, every year you have a certain number of graduates, what percentage of those would you say continue with a career in the industry, per se, and how many of them divert into other industries and apply what they've learned into other industries? It has been a trend for almost a decade, a bit less, of 50-50. Wow. In terms of employer. Um, right. So really the statistics based on who employs, 50-50, um, yes. People who go into operation in hospitality, move up the ladder, being in headquarters or staying because that was their true calling to be in a hotel operation, family owned or not, etc. And 50% in other industry. And that spectrum of other industry keeps on opening up every year because again, we didn't see it before, but it's these new employers who show up in our career fairs who said, we like the attitude, we like the customer centricity. Yeah. Uh, we like the fact that they, it's, it's a university of applied science. I know you come from Germany, so this term makes sense. So the dual education, they don't know just theory, but they know the workplace. Mm. And it changes everything in terms of attitude, in terms of for management, someone who has already known a workplace and the codes of them it's easier to put them uh, so they came and they say I had them as an intern, an intern I want them back um, they know business skills they know how to interact in a team animate a team and they know how to um, adapt to context mm. so clearly and, and for me it's we are taking simply hospitality values yeah and bring in them. So for example, we had a lot of alumni in clinics in, because obviously the, we all know the hospitals and the clinic side are working really hard on what they used to call the bedside manners and the whole hospitality. Uh, 
but many other, the banking industry, the, um, the NGOs, the, uh, we see our students in really a lot of industries. Yeah, well there are other service related industries as well outside of the industry so I think that's also important and, and again I mean you look at um, a classic example I always find especially around the retail side is when, when Apple started their retail stores mm -hmm. who did they go to to get their training done by their management? They went to Ritz-Carlton and yeah. they got their training done by Ritz-Carlton exactly. uh, and there's a reason for that. And that, That's exactly what we're doing with our advisory branch we have a EHL advisory and that's what we do mm. and with our, we launched three institutes for uh, applied research and one of them is um, a customer management experience and one of the lab is funded by Audemars Piguet who's yeah. working on, on retail labs. Uh, we have with Metro in Germany who is uh, training uh, restaurateurs of how, how to help them and I'm co-director of the Institute for Nutrition where we're looking for new solutions and new concepts. Uh, yes uh, and, and it's always this approach uh, and I always say, it's, these are hospital. I learned these values from hospitality. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Okay. One other question around the staffing side, of it, and especially now, we're finding as the industry does start to come back and, and recover, that a lot of them are starting to see a, a labour shortage. Yes. And we even had a labour shortage before the yes. pandemic. And the, again, now the recovery has kind of highlighted that. So the problem's becoming even more pronounced. And as the ability to attract and, and also retain uh, qualified employees is becoming increasingly difficult, and I know you personally feel very strongly about investing in talent mm -hmm. because you see so many of your graduates increasingly seek careers outside of the hospitality industry. So about, as you mentioned, 50% of them are completely in different industries. So um, how do you believe the industry should retain these top graduates and the future leaders? Because obviously we may lose a lot of good talent to outside of the industry. Mm -hmm. So how can we retain them? And how can we keep them interested in and engaged in the industry to build and to enhance their careers? And what do hotel companies need to do to improve on this so that they're lucrative for the top talent? It's, it's a big one, but you're right, it's a dear to my heart because I, I see sometimes not wasted talent, but I see students or graduates at EHL, really great talents who would like to pursue a career in hospitality and then go for something else. And um, so there are a lot of companies in the hospitality industry who are leading the way and giving an example. One example that's close to my heart because I really like that concept is Citizen M. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of, you like it or no, you can be a good fit or no, but that's, that's another story. But it's one example amongst a lot that understand that people need a purpose. So we all know that why do we leave a company? Uh, money comes is important, but I think uh, in a research I read, I think in the top five, I think it ranked three or four money. The first is your manager and your superior. So I think it, it's uh, working with the management, uh, the direct management, spending time. Other companies I've been discussing with in terms of also this development is for season. One alumni is in our uh, international advisory board and, and he's a chief there. Uh, so there are some companies again, and it, it Four Seasons uh, tackles it completely differently. IHG as well. It, it's really a career path. It's an M, you know, it's more, but it's more related to their customer value proposition. So I think some companies got it really right and, and they attract the, the talent. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They, they get to choose from. Um, others, I think, we again, we need to stop, need to stop copying and see what can we offer. Mm -hmm. And um, But the students, the graduate, and I see it also as a manager, people need a purpose, need to know that they're contributing to something. Salary, we know in hospitality is important, but I think it's just the tangible element. Being treated as a disposable element because you just wait tables or I think it's something we have to rethink. Yeah, I agree with you. And some companies know it. I'm not, I, mean, I don't think I'm a bit innovator here. No. A lot of people it's understood. It's kind of stating it. the obvious, really. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people understood it. And I spoke with a lot of hoteliers, you know, those who have been having great staff for the last 40 years or over two generations. Mm. It's not by luck. They're no. doing something, and it's not necessarily just paying them more. Mm. It's part of it. I mean, yeah. I'm, uh, I mean, paying. I mean, uh, one of the uh, conditions, for example, for us for the internship is we ask for paid internships for, for our students. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying it's trivial and it's not important, but really in that research, of why do people leave their job? 
um, it was ranked three or four. Mm. Uh, oh, I think company culture, personal development of staff, all of those things need to be available. Yes, yeah. and I think it's also, uh, it's not the fault of the direct manager, it's also working with and giving the tools to the direct manager, even more now in a, in a remote environment. The role of a team lead and a middle management with this COVID situation or that will last after because with this uh, home office, I think it's interesting research and practice to develop. Yeah, yeah yes. very good. Okay. EHL here have something called the Innovation Village. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that and what exactly is that and what's its objective and, and what, what, what is it setting out to do? So we started off small, and but we have a great ambition. We already have uh, startups that we selected with uh, experts from the field and faculty, um, and we support them. We also have an innovation fund where we have companies investing for these startups. The idea is to create this ecosystem also with the vill village uh, of innovation, innovation village, where we have people meeting up virtually or not uh, to exchange about new concepts, new things, um, having different uh, disciplines coming in um, and, and the idea is to integrate it with our research, with our mission of as a University of Applied Science for Applied Research. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting times. Mm -hmm. um, we are still again finding our tr unique value proposition and positioning with, with the different stakeholders but, but I think we, we are um, going ahead, uh, I think stay tuned, there will be some interesting things. Okay. Okay, great. Up. Is it an opportunity as well for some students, perhaps that might have more of an entrepreneurial streak in them, and with a, with a bright idea? Is that something that you would then yes. they would then come to you for that support and perhaps opportunity? If they want, what we provide, what what I put together with the teams three four years ago is already integrating entrepreneurship opportunities for those students because we realize they represent sometimes up to twenty percent of of a cohort who have this ambition for entrepreneurship and higher ed sometimes is too rigid so we integrated milestones where for example they can do their internship in their startups provided trillions of guidelines because otherwise mm. it's just going to stay home I mean yeah. again 20 years old and <laughs> human beings so uh, we integrated the whole path whether they want to stay after with us in our incubator or go into another one I think it's it's up to them to see, but obviously they have that opportunity. One of them is has stayed with us and has been very successful. Belong, um, they measure. They it's a, it's a it's a certification for carbon impact, mm -hmm. and it's been they've been around for almost ten years now, mm -hmm. and. And yes, they, they have been influencing the whole region mm -hmm. and more. Mm -hmm. So um, some of them will decide, but we definitely want to foster, I mean, guide or coach or be there for those who have entrepreneurship ambitions because we know that it's a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes before they make it. Yeah. That's entrepreneurship yeah. journey. Yeah. And we want to be there along the way too. Because as soon as they start, the earlier they start, the more they make the mistakes in the classroom and they'll be ready to be yeah. more successful yeah. after. Very good. And the other element, you, you touched on it a little bit before, was the digitization of the academic portfolio. Um, and some examples that, that um, that, I, that you've mentioned to us in the past was high flex virtual housekeeping and gamification. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how does that apply to, to what you're doing? So as I was mentioning earlier, we saw this COVID situation, the technology as an enhancer of learning so that the faculty can better teach and the students and the learner learn in a deep way that it's not just go to the exam, put it all out and then forget even what it was about, but really deep learning. Um, and, and digital tools can allow you to, to do that, be it from, I don't know, access to your notes or books after. Um, it's trivial, but it's something online access for it or how you are evaluated, group works, um, following your journey. Um, so these are the time I was talking about asynchronous. We also mentioned that we started already before using other tools. We have a, a housekeeping a small course with a virtual reality where they can go and clean a cleaner room uh, um, downtown on virtual reality and discuss. And we realize it's great for learning communication. Mm -hmm. It was intended and designed by our housekeeping faculty and it's really good, but we also discovered that it was great for communication because one has that the 
mask and the others are in, on the screen and they will shout at each other. And so we realized it was a great tool for learning how to communicate. So that's our journey day after day <laughs> into discovering how to better prepare this talent. Yeah. All right. Now, a couple of, of my favorites questions okay. for you. First one is what's been the most, well, first of all, what's your favorite hotel? And what's been one of the most memorable hotel experiences that you've had and why? Oops. <laughs> you know, my position. <laughs> they say, why did you say this or how? <laughs> no, jokes aside, uh, I don't have a favorite hotel. Obviously, my parents are in the hotel business in Tunisia, so I have a sentimental feeling for the family one. Yep. Um, Makes sense. Uh, but, you know. That's that's the one where I'm on the board and, and I've been helping a lot. So mm -hmm. um, I know that hotel since it was built. So um, I have many. Uh, yeah, I've been very lucky with my parents to travel a lot. So and now with this position also. Yeah. So and meeting all these alumni. So best most memorable. You would be surprised when you when I when I I heard the question the first time. Is, is, uh, it's going to be funny. It's, it's not, you know, it's not this. Um, in 2009, I went with my family in a trek in the south of Libya mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to, for 10 days or a week to see the, we call them in French, peinture rupestre, you know, the prehistoric painting hu oh, first yes. human beings yes, did, yes, yes. you know, on the wall with, and with the eggshell, egg, yeah. egg yolk. And, and uh, so we went and, and we did the whole week in the really deep south near Nigeria and, and, and uh, of Libya. Wow. in 2009 and we did the whole trek for for a, a week camping under tents and and everything and obviously one of the nights was you're in the middle of the desert so you see the stars yeah amazing but my most memorable is at the end of that the first hotel it was just small huts and they had showers oh wow <laughs> and i still really until now <laughs> Almost. <laughs> you were very grateful for that. <laughs> I still remember the feeling for that shower after walking Amazing, in yeah. the desert yeah, for, for a week and sleeping in the camp. So, and I remember I was with my nephew who was three years old. And, and he fell off the bed during the night because for 10 days we, we, we slept on the floor. <laughs> so it, it's still, I know it's not, you know, glamorous. And, no, and, it doesn't and, have to be and, glamorous. It sounds amazing. But I, I think I will never forget that night yeah. where we sat down with, with the tribes and ate. I mean, we ate the whole week on the floor with, with wow. everybody. And, and we met people, you know, the Tuareg, you were just in the middle of Sahara, I think, and you're alone and someone shows up. <laughs> Uh, and he has some food to share or something. So yeah, for me these were um, this was a unique trip. Yeah, absolutely, and, it sounds amazing. Uh, I'm just uh, now that I have children, I I hope that one day I can give them. But but yeah, that night stay. Yeah. It's still. I think I'm not gonna forget it. No, so. I did. I, yeah, I'm sure I can't you remember won't. the name of the hotel though. No, that's I don't okay. even know if it was a hotel. It's not I think it was a camp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it has water. But it also just goes to show, you know, an experience like that. You have such a fond memory. It doesn't have to be top end. It doesn't have no. to be five star. You, you know, the beauty of, of our industry is you can experience amazing experiences yes. at any level. It really is how you approach it. Yeah, and the people were so nice, so that's generous. That's amazing, yeah. And again, they had shower. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, that's such a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, and the final one, what's your favorite restaurant and food? Oh, I, I, I'm very foodie and yeah. that's why I love being here and, and I, I love interact with the chefs and learn and I feel so like a five-year-old still learning and learning so I, I love every, try, trying new things and new food. Um, I'm biracial from my upbringing so um, yes, I'm curious about that. Um, restaurant experience is not really my thing. Um, uh, so I don't have a favorite and I'm, I'm starting to be very picky now so mm -hmm. and I, I prefer be with friends, simple cook, cooking with friends at home. Uh, but there is one restaurant I realized I go every year. Mm -hmm. Again, it's in Tunisia. And uh, yeah, I, I make a point when I can to go every year. It's it's in a, in a town by the sea in Tunisia called Kelibia. Mm -hmm. Best um, beach in Tunisia. It's a good seafood. So yes, the restaurant is the rocks are in the in in the sea. So you, you have your private swimming pool mm -hmm. if you want, natural, and they serve you. They put the table really on the rocks, and you can spend the day there. Oh, beautiful! Yeah. So wow. every, once a year, I, I make sure I go there. Now the food is a bit posh. The place is becoming a bit posh, but uh, but still uh, worth it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I realize 
when you ask the question that I try to go every year, it's the only one yeah. I try to go every yeah. year. That's great. So it must be that maybe it must it's be my good. favorite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Well, Ines Blau, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you being on the show and, and for hosting us today. And it's been great talking to you. Thank you. Same. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And uh, we really um, will be coming to you with some more videos coming up very sh shortly again as we start to open up. And if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the bell button for your reminders. And until next time, it's bye for now. Bye.